Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. All right, so if you've been here before, you know Love Gives is something we're doing different every week. If today's your first day, Jimmy's going to tell us what's next. So we are looking at providing some funds for bulletproof vests for two cities. One is Layton City Police. The other one is Morgan Sheriff. So I have Chief Wagner here today, which is awesome to have you. Thank you so much. Good to have you. And... uh, so I went to Morgan City, I drove up there, talked to the admin and say, hey, I need to talk to someone maybe about us, you know, helping them out and doing something. Like, go talk to Chief Wagner. I open up the door. He's like, hey, Jimmy, I go to your church. I'm like, no kidding. <laughs> so it even got better. And so we're looking at providing some fun. So tell us a little about the need, Chief. So these, these vests are one of the most important safety pieces of equipment that we have, but they do have an expiration date. They recommend that they be replaced every five years. And one thing I hadn't told you until the last service is we're actually in our five-year cycle that we need to replace them this year. So what a blessing that our sheriff's office has for this opportunity. So you're saying it's gonna make a difference. This is gonna be huge. Words can't express how grateful I am and the rest of the sheriff's office for this opportunity. Well, it's a privilege for us to do that. Thank you so much, Chief. Thanks for being here too. Thanks for attending Washington Heights, too. <laughs> so, so last week, we talked about a couple of girls, 19 and 23, who are the daughters of one of our pastor and our partners in Haiti, where they fled the country. Could you imagine just telling your daughters, hey, I'm going to stay in a very dangerous place, but it's not safe for you. You need to go. And just making them leave the country. And so they're right now with their uncle in Florida. They can't work. They can't go to school. So we're looking at providing some livelihood for them, just so how they can live, you know, here. And so this is uh, beautiful girls here. And so we're just hoping that and just want to thank you for your generosity. So we're going to continue with this and give a small amount to the refugees, too. Some people have already taken the refugees out to eat. And they've already told me how, what a crazy, fun experience it's been. And that was last week. But we got a couple of things. Let me just run through some of the things that we're talking about and been doing. We've got 300 and about 25 boxes out there we're going to give to the employees of the DCFS and those who work with that kind of very dark part of our culture, right? All the, uh, the kids who are being abused. So we're going to give it to the employees. We're do, we did a supply drive. Um, which we got tons, and it's still going. If you want to be able to provide sweats, pants, socks, coats, jackets, beanies, anything like that, gloves, for the refugees. We'll take that probably in the next couple of weeks to them. Feed My Starving Children, that was a great party, wasn't it? And so we did that. And then we're looking at any additional funds that come in over this amount Okay, we're going to give to the Haitian ministry there. It is a very dark place. You can't hardly get anything in or out at this time, especially because of the safety factor. So we don't want to keep in the money. If you look at your bulletin, too, or your program on the back side, it's just a great thing. I don't know if God did this or it was a misprint. It says, it says right here we're asking for how much? 115000 right? If you look on here, it says $1.1 million. So I'm okay with that, Okay. <laughs> Just to let you know. God can do anything. I'm believing for it. So whatever you give, once again, 100% goes here. So we're looking at 1.1 million, all right? <laughs> One million dollars. So, <laughs> Okay, so anyways, we're getting close to this figure too. Let me show you the next slide. So this is what we got currently, and this is awesome. This is really, really awesome. And so we're aiming for this. We have this, we're right on track. You'll notice some envelopes right in the seat in front of you. Feel free to grab one of these. Whatever you give in here goes 100% to what we're doing. So thank you so much. And we, have we got something else. Up. We're not done with announcements, sorry. <laughs> so on 1214, who is bringing the message at the blue Christmas service? I am, so you know, so it's a blue Christmas. <laughs> so blue Christmas, what is that about? That is actually during this time of year, it's a very dark time for some people. They've gone through a lot. They're alone. We're inviting anybody and everybody that maybe is by themselves or just having a struggling during this time, right? Mm-hmm. 
that please, you can come here at six o'clock, have a dinner, and then we'll have a message afterwards. And then we got what going on the 24th? We got the candlelight services, and this year you don't need a reservation. One, two thirty, four, and five thirty. It's going to be awesome. Whole bunch. Bring of them. a friend. Whole bunch of them. And then finally, we're going to have a virtual Christmas on that Sunday, the twenty-sixth. So we won't be here, but we will be here online. And so we invite you and your families to sit down with us, with our families, and do a virtual Christmas on Christmas Day right the day after. So it would just be a great time. A lot so going fun. on. It's all in your program in front of you too. So grab that on the way out. Thank you, Jimmy. Okay, we'll see you, Tammy. All right. So many fun things going on this time of year. And it is a fun time of year, right? It's supposed to be really happy and, and jolly. And yet it's also supposed to be very spiritual and encouraging and holy. And I got to thinking, it's really a jumbled up stuff. Because... Anybody recognize this house? Is it yours? Because if it is, you are awesome. I can't do this, and I just don't want my husband getting on the roof. But if you're doing that, this is awesome. Although, I mean, it's a lot, right? It, sometimes we can go overboard on our traditions. I don't know if you can ever go overboard on lights. We were in North Carolina recently, my husband and I, and we were driving around just in a different culture, different place, looking to see how they did their lights. And it's funny because there were a lot of white lights, not a lot of colored lights. I mean, it was beautiful until we rounded this corner. And I'm like, oh, look, there's a park. There's a park over there. Let's go look at the park. So we drove through and we started in and I'm looking and I said, that is not a park. That is a house. And they're set back, you know, the homes in this neighborhood are that old-fashioned set back. And then the next neighbor had more, and the next neighbor had even more. And it just went on and on. And I thought, I wonder if it started out real small. It was just one house that started doing something, and it started getting lit, lit up. And then the next neighbor, and the next neighbor. And I said to my husband, you know, I'll bet every year they say, how many more lights can we get up there? He said, no, they're saying, how can we increase wattage? How much more can we increase? And those of you who get that, get that. All right, so we got this going on, tradition. How about the Christmas tree thing, right? I really started thinking about it. I love my Christmas tree. But we clear a room. We take stuff down that we love, that we bought maybe three weeks ago to have right there or some precious heirloom so we can put a big fake tree or a dead tree. I mean, it's dying in the middle. Again, I do this and I love it, but I just scratch head. This one, you got to think about that. That probably was just so that they didn't have Christmas conflict anymore, I'm thinking. That's just a great way to come together. This new tradition, this ugly sweater thing, I really want to get on board, but I think I need somebody to give me a sweater because I can't go to the store and honestly look at something and go, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. I have to have it. It just doesn't make sense, but I know it's fun. I know it's fun. And then this, these sweaters, I just got no words, but it's so cute. It's really cute. And then finally, <clears throat> wah, radio stations that actually change their whole repertoire. They don't even play any regular songs. They play only Christmas songs, which I love, and I could probably listen to them all year, but I know there's people over here in this camp that are like, nope, first of December, after Christmas, we're done. So I love this. I love the music. But there's one song, right? Do you know which one it is? Grandma got... Come on. Yeah. Strange. Weird tradition, but a fun song. Well, in all reality, there's a lot of things going on. But it's time for us to just sit back, calm our hearts, and think about the real reason we come here today. And the real reason, no matter what season it is, but especially now, the gift that we've been given. So will you pray with me? God, in this time that you've given us, 
We thank you for laughter, and we thank you for joy, and we thank you for the ability to do so many wonderful things. But right now, Lord, I just pray you would bless the hearing of your word and the reading of your word, and that as each one of us, as this service ends today, we would just know you more, and we would love you more, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, so we're in the book of Isaiah again today. Pastor Roy last week spoke from Isaiah, and Isaiah was a prophet in the Old Testament when God used them to speak his truth and warn people. We now have Jesus who does that for us. But back then, Isaiah had a lot of prophecies about things to come and about light and about future. But he also was trying to warn the people of that day that there are hard times coming. There was a king, King Ahaz, who, he was a 20-something, his father before him was just a godly king. But then Ahaz came around and he lined up and he did not do things the way that it was supposed to be done. Let's look in here. Isaiah 9-2 part of his pro- Isaiah's prophecy. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. So again, we ask the question, what people, what light? Well, in order to understand that, I've given a little bit of a hint there, but let's go back to chapter 8 in Isaiah. It comes right before where we're going to start. Here's what he's saying. He's telling the king, he's telling the people, they will pass through the land greatly distressed and hungry, and when they are hungry, they will be enraged and speak contemptuously against their king and their God and turn their faces upward, and they will look to the earth, but behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. And he's trying to tell Ahaz, turn, stop. So who are these people? Well, they're the Israelites who are in captivity. So King Ahaz aligned with the Assyrians, and they had come in, and they had taken several places, several people, the Israelites, into captivity. They were in bondage. And because that was happening, they started turning back to the things they knew before. And it's so interesting to me because I find it in myself at times. When things are bad or there's a shocking news or something, I turn inward instead of upward. And for them, in this dark time, in their anger, their hopelessness, their fear, they were turning to the occult. They were turning to their superstitions again, to the gods of the gods of the gods. And so they wouldn't listen, and King Ahaz wouldn't listen. He was a godless king, and he wasn't going to hear it. He had an opportunity, but he was not going to hear it. And so Isaiah shifts. So here we are in 8, we're moving down. Isaiah shifts the focus towards things to come. Here we'll start in Isaiah 9.1. Nevertheless, So he left that, and now he's saying, here's here's what else is coming. There will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. I have a map here that will show the way of the sea. So it goes from Egypt, clear up to Damascus and on. It's a major trade route. It was um, used heavily. But what's so interesting is what Isaiah was telling us. God was predicting the address of Jesus right there in that verse because he was going to be born here. So the way of the sea, the Via Maris, Right in here is where Jesus did most of his ministry. And so it's still in that major trade route. 700 years before he came, God was giving the address of the one to come. So we move on. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, 
a light has shined. All right, so we know who the people are. What about this light? What is it? Let's read on. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. Pretty amazing. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So it wasn't just for those people. It was for people to come. Then he goes on to talk about the characteristics of the light. The light is a child. He's a son. He is both human and divine. And I know that's hard sometimes for us to comprehend. And it's a mystery, but it's true. And growing up like I did, I didn't grow up understanding the Bible. I didn't grow up in a church that taught the Bible. So my vision of who Jesus was and who God was was very different. And so there's this fancy word called the hypostatic union that describes how that happens. How can he be human and God at the same time? So if you want to look that up, if that's something you struggle with, look it up. But anyway, it is together he is human and divine. He became human to identify with human struggles, our struggles. He walked the earth. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. He knows what it's like to be rejected, to be misunderstood. He can identify with how we feel any time of our life. The light is Jesus. So Isaiah is describing this light and what it's going to be. We get the power and the privilege because we have the book to know who that is. He's come, he's done his thing, but let's talk about it. Let's look at the names he gave him when we read that verse. First, wonderful counselor. He is the perfect counselor. Being human, he guides me. He guides you. When I say me, you say me. So he guides me and you say, don't say it out loud. I didn't mean that. What I meant was he guides me and he guides you. Okay? Being human, he guides me. I can trust him. I can realize that he was here, that he knows what it was like. And he knows I'm just not whining or it's not that I don't have enough faith. Being divine, being God, the one and only God, he knows what I need. He knows what we need before we even need it. He knows the very number of hairs on your head. That's how much we can trust this counselor. He's given us his word. He's given us people in our lives that we can go to and pray with. He knows exactly what we need. And he will always do what is right and best for us. He knows it doesn't feel like it sometimes. I know. I get it. I don't know where you're at today, and you don't know where I'm at today, but we all have needs. And sometimes it feels like, God, do you even know? Do you even know what's right for me? Because this doesn't feel right. But we can trust that he does. He's a mighty God. El Gabor is a name in the Bible that means mighty God. He is mighty to save. And we could trust that. Because he's mighty, he rescues me. And he can rescue you. Only in the Bible do we find a God who comes to us, rescues us in the middle of our mess, whether we did it or somebody did it to us. The others, we have to work our way. We can be enlightened or we can do enough good things or we can, it's always something else. But this God, this mighty God rescues us. He comes to us, scoops us up, cleans us off. It's amazing. He's heroic. 
He is heroic. He brings order out of chaos. And I'm telling you, any parents in here that have had a little baby that won't stop crying, or maybe like twins, and I'm telling you, twins aren't just two of one. It's like a whole other world. We just have some now in our family. And we need a hero to write in and calm us and help us to know it's going to be okay. He is a hero in the smallest things in your life and in the largest things. And he's a doer of great things. If you weren't here last week, Pastor Roy talked about, in, he was in Isaiah and talked about another prophecy. And it's powerful. I would encourage you to watch it if you haven't because it talks about what he's going to do when he comes back. And it's amazing. And it's great. And we can rest knowing that. He is our everlasting Father. The promise is in the title, Everlasting. I will never leave you. He's a father without end. There is no beginning and no end. He's got us, and we can trust him. He adopts me, and he adopts you. And I don't know, maybe you had a really lousy father here on earth, and I'm sorry. And it's hard, even the word father can kind of be a trigger for us sometimes. It's hard to think of him as a father if you haven't had a good example. Or maybe, you know, you don't know your father. Maybe he was never in the picture. Or maybe your father's passed on and he's not here now and you wish you could go sit with him and just get some wisdom. Here's the promise for us. Everlasting father, there is no end and he's perfect. He just waits for us to call on him, to talk to him, to trust him, and know that he will be with us for all eternity. He will never leave. And he is the Prince of Peace. This one, for me, is so important and has been ever since I came to that place of trusting him in my life and understanding who he was. He's our Prince of Peace. He calms me. He can calm you. Sometimes you just breathe deep and all you can do is say his name, Jesus, Jesus. And there's a calmness that can happen because he's the prince of peace. He sustains me. When times are at their worst, we don't have to give in and we don't have to give up because come what may, he will sustain us. It may feel like it's forever, but it won't be. I've heard it said, if you haven't gone through it, it's not over. So keep going. This verse here has been one of my favorites, and I had to share it today. I don't know if any of you need this, but I hope that it can bring you some peace. In Philippians, it says, Then you will experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And I had the privilege of watching this play out with a very special person in my life, my dad. So several years ago, I had come to the place where I had realized that the God I had grown up with wasn't the biblical God. And that I could never earn enough or do enough. And I was in a mess and surrendered my life. But my parents hadn't. But they would come here to Washington Heights. And they would come to the Christmas Eve service or Easter. And when they'd leave, they'd say, I don't know. There's just something about that place. I just feel better when I leave. And I'm like, I know it's God. It's the Holy Spirit. It's love. But I had to be kind of careful. I didn't want to push anything, you know? So you just kind of walk along with them and pray and pray. Well, one day, my dad needed to have some tests. And we went and had the tests, and the doctor came out, and it was me and my mom and dad. And he said, Cliff, I got bad news. You've got a pretty aggressive cancer. And it's stage four. And we don't know what, what, what the next steps are, but we're going to get you in the system And some of you may be going through this right now, and we'll keep doing tests. 
And I remember getting in the car and thinking, oh, no. And so we were driving home, and um, they weren't active in their religious faith at this time, so they really had no connection. They didn't have anything. And I thought, there was a man here. His name was Pastor Les McGee, and he was here before Roy. Roy replaced him. And Pastor McGee was the only pastor I'd ever known and the only pastor they knew, even though they didn't know him. And I said, Dad, you want me to call Pastor McGee to come out and pray? I just thought, just take a step. Just ask. And he said, yes. And I thought, oh, yeah. So I called Pastor McGee, and he came over to the house, and he started talking to my dad, and he said, Cliff, you've had a pretty tough blow today, and you've got some pretty hard news. Are you ready? Do you know where you're going when you die? And I remember my dad saying, I don't know for sure. I've always believed in God, but I don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if I've done too many bad things. I just don't know where I'll, what level I'll be on. And Les, with his kind eyes, said, Oh, Cliff, it's not about what you've done. It's about what Jesus wants to do for you. And in that moment, he said, you know, we could pray about this. You could receive that gift of forgiveness and grace and know where you're going. And I was just thinking, oh, is he going to pray? And so we knelt down. My dad said, I want to pray. And they prayed this most beautiful prayer together. And I'll never forget the look on my dad's face when he looked up. There was peace like I hadn't seen. And then fast forward about four years. He, he fought hard for about four years. And I gave him a little devotional book, you know. And one day he said to me, Hey, Tam, I, I'd like maybe a Bible. i kind of like to know what's coming before and after. And I thought, oh, yes. This is what it's all about. So I gave him the Bible. And then there was that day when we went to the doctor and the doctor said, There's no more we can do, Cliff. You fought a good fight, but this is it. And we're driving home, and he looked over at me, and he said, Tam, if I had to go through all of this and get cancer and go through the trials I've gone through to know the peace I know, I want you to know it was all worth it. And that was powerful. That is this, God's peace that we cannot understand. His passing was peaceful, and his story lives on. It's amazing. He is the Prince of Peace. One day Jesus claimed, I am the light of the world. And he said it right here. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you have the light that leads to life. One day he declared... You are the light of the world. And this is what he said. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. We get the privilege as we trust him and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, not by anything we've done, but all by his grace and mercy to be the light to people in a dark world. Right now, we're living in a world just like they did there. May not be in bondage physically, but spiritually, emotionally, we are. We are, and there's a world hurting that needs the light. And you may be thinking, you know, well, that's great, Tammy, but you don't know what's going on in my life. I don't feel like being the light. And I know sometimes I don't either. But maybe it's just a random act of kindness like Mark talked about. Maybe it's a kind word to somebody in the store. Maybe it's just sharing your story of Jesus and what he's done for you. I think a lot of times people feel like we're too messed up for Jesus to love us. And when we share, hey, we're messed up, we're all messed up, but we love Jesus and he loves us, there's just a freedom that comes with that. And so I brought these objects here just to show we're all different, you know? For some of us, it takes somebody else 
to light our candle, and maybe it takes more than that. <laughs> maybe somebody's praying for us. There we go. You could be like, oh, this is a good one if you're struggling. You just want the easy. You just want to say, I see you. I hope you have a great day. Whatever it is, you can do that. You can be kind. Or like a pocket flashlight. Maybe there's a little more to you on some days than others. And some of us are tall and some of us are small. And some of us can't share. And some of us can share a lot. The point is, we all want to be like this guy, right? Mm, want to be the light, shine in the light. Well, I bought this and then I couldn't even get it to work. So I had to change my story this morning. Sometimes it's harder to get our light on. And then we have the mag light, right? We've got the mag light. And that thing is amazing. And sometimes we're a mag light. Sometimes we're a candle. It just, the point is, it doesn't matter. God's got somebody for you to connect with this season, to share the love. All we got to do is share the love we've been given and the truth we've been given, however it comes out. I want to encourage you this season. Well, let's review. What light Jesus? What people? All people, not just the Israelites. It's us and it's this hurting world. And I want to encourage you, don't just go see the lights this season. Be the light. Be a light to somebody. God will give you the ability. And if you're in a place where you're like, I just don't know, I get it. I get it. I don't know what you're going through and you don't know what I'm going through. But we have the same God who can help us to bring light to a dark world. And if you're at a place where you're thinking, I don't even know. I want to believe so bad. I want to tell God. It's scary. But after all we've talked about, all he is, you can receive this mighty God, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, everlasting father for yourself. We're going to take a minute to pray. And I pray that wherever you're at, you can open your heart to Jesus. God, thank you for your words today. Thank you for the gift of this Bible. Thank you for this place where we can come together and celebrate you and worship you and sometimes really open our heart to you. And I pray now, Lord, that, that for those who have followed God for a long time, they followed you, Lord. They know Jesus, but they're hurting. I pray in this moment they could surrender to you and just say, Lord, give me more light. Give me your peace. Help me to trust you. Help me to make a difference in somebody else's life. And God, I know you know the hearts of everybody in this room and those who are watching online. And if there's somebody that doesn't know you, they're too afraid to release their life to you, that in this moment, they would say, Jesus, I want to receive you. I want your light in me, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Forgive me, cleanse me, and help me to walk with you and trust you and be a light to others. Thank you, God, that we can trust you. All we do is mess up and all you do is clean us up and we are grateful, Jesus. Thank you for this season that we can reflect on you. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media, at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram, and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.